Everyone's saying, how can you just overturn a, a Supreme Court precedent, 50 years of case law? How can you just, in one foul swoop, just boom, done? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because that's what a huge chunk of this decision talks about, is why the Supreme Court was able to go ahead and make that decision and go ahead and overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And that's what I want to go over with you. That's the main part of this video. I'm also going to go over uh, the concurring opinions today as well and give you a brief rundown on those. I'll talk a little bit about the dissenting opinion not a whole lot because number one, dissenting opinions aren't important unless they're a good read, and this one's not a good read. And second, you know, I, I don't care. So there. Um, and then I'll go over where the pro-life, uh, pro-life anti-abortion uh, people like me, where we need to go from here because this is just the big first step. This is the cornerstone on where we need to build. The pro-life movement from here we got this huge win that's great we need to build on it so that's what i'm going to talk about today as well so let's go ahead and get started we're going to start with um the supreme court of the united states overturning roe v wade in the case uh hobbs versus uh jackson women's health organization uh justice alito delivered the opinion for the court and like i said i went over this before uh in a previous video so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to the main part, the part that I think is most important, and that's how could the court just go ahead and overturn precedent that's been around for 50 years? How could they do that? That that seems kind of odd, right? And yeah, technically that, that would make sense. So let me make sure I get to that part of the opinion. Let's go. It is about right here. Here we go. So what I want to draw your attention to is right here. So he... They go specifically over, Justice Alito goes specifically over the five factors that weigh strongly in favor of overruling Roe and Casey. And those five factors are the nature of their error, the quality of their reasoning, the workability of the rules they impose on the country, their disruptive effect on other areas of the law, and the absence of concrete reliance. So he starts off and he goes in order here. So he starts off with the nature of the court's error. An erroneous interpretation of the Constitution is always important, but some are more damaging than others. The infamous decision in Plessy v. Ferguson was one such decision. It betrayed our commitment to equality before the law. It was egregiously wrong on the day it was decided. And the Solicitor General agreed at oral argument it should have been overruled at the earliest opportunity. So even the government that had to defend that case said uh, that was bad law. And if you're not familiar with Plessy versus Ferguson, it was a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court said that um, they, they put in place the principle of separate but, but equal. So you could have se like separate schools for black people, separate schools for white people. You could have separate water fountains for black people, separate water fountains for white people. It put in place that as being something perfectly legal, perfectly fine under our law, which it wasn't. But it said, oh yeah, as long as it's equal, that's fine. You can make them separate. That's fine. Well, that's what Plessy versus Ferguson did. And you saw it crop up all over. The South had a lot of, did a lot of things like that. You see pictures from, from back in the day, you know, the coloreds only drinking fountains. That's out. That's because of Plessy versus Ferguson, and you know it. And even though it said, "Oh yeah, it's equal," it usually was not equal. You know the the white schools got better, got more funding than the black schools. Um, you know per pupil, they might be like the same amount of dollars, but you might have more black kids at a school, and they needed more money, so they weren't actually getting the same funding. Things like that would happen. Uh, the sometimes the water fountain for the black kids was like all the way around on the other side of the school outside whereas the ones for the white kids was inside where it was a little bit cooler and you know and things like that so it's a you know that's a stain on our history and that is a a court case that kind of upheld that that stain you know that solidified that well it ended up getting overturned by the supreme court they said that was egregiously wrong at the time and it it needed to be overturned so that's what happened here is that 
Roe versus Wade at the time was a terrible decision. It, it was not grounded in the Constitution at all. And, you know, it says right here, Roe was also egregiously wrong and deeply damaging. For reasons already explained, Roe's constitutional analysis was far outside the bounds of any reasonable interpretation of the various constitutional provisions to which it vaguely pointed. So, yeah, so how wrong was it? It was very wrong. So it was it was wrong the day it was decided, it's wrong now. So good, that's strike one. And remember, Justice Alito is giving them five strikes here. This, you know, this is better than baseball. So it, it was bad. It was a bad decision at the time. It was bad then, bad now, a good reason to overturn. However, that's not enough to overturn a, a Supreme Court precedent, especially one 50 years old. So you go on to the next one, the quality of reasoning. Under our precedents, the quality of the reasoning in the prior case has an important bearing on whether it should be reconsidered. <clears throat> we explained why Roe was incorrectly decided, but that decision was more than just wrong. It stood on exceptionally weak grounds. Roe found that the Constitution implicitly conferred a right to obtain an abortion, but it failed to ground its decision in text, history, or precedent. So, in other words, it just made the right up out of nowhere. So it kind of took parts of the 14th Amendment, parts of the 9th Amendment, parts of, uh, you know, various other uh, dis, you know, precedents that had nothing to do with the abortion debate and said, oh, well, we're just going to kind of make this work. And their, their reasoning was awful. It was so bad. The reasoning was so bad in row that... You know, even even Casey, the 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 case that also got overruled in this one, even they said they kind of overturned Roe a little bit in part, and had to again make something up on the fly to to preserve an abortion right, which was absolutely ridiculous. They even admitted that in Casey. So yeah, so quality of reasoning again, awful. You know, again, even in the Casey plurality. While reaffirming Roe's central holding, pointedly refrained from endorsing, uh, they, po they pointedly refrained from endorsing most of its reasoning. It revised the textual basis for the abortion right, silently abandoned Roe's erroneous historical narrative, and jettisoned the trimester framework. But it replaced the scheme with an arbitrary undue burden test and relied on exceptional, an exceptional version of stare decisis that, as explained below, this court has never before applied and has never invoked since so in other words they decided to fix a shitty ruling with another shitty ruling fix bad law with more bad law and that's what happened here and it was just reasoned terribly so there's strike two so now moving on to the next part see here we've got the next one here is see i believe on page here it is workability so um again so far all we have is how bad was it and how bad was the reasoning because you can have a, a bad decision but you know it's reasoned pretty well and you know maybe they got it wrong but let's not upset the apple cart just because it's wrong you know it's you know, it, it was reasoned well. I, I, I can kind of see where you're coming from. Fine. But now we have workability. Workability, uh, what, what that means is that uh, basically can the, can the court and can lawyers, you know, work with this thing? Can they be lawyers? And, you know, Justice Lito goes on here and says, Our precedents counsel that another important consideration in, deter in deciding whether a precedent should be overruled... <clears throat> is whether the rule it, it imposes is workable. That is whether it can be understood and applied in a consistent and predictable manner. <coughs> so uh, Casey's undue burden test has scored poorly on the workability scale. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the problems with the very concept of an undue burden, <coughs> as Justice Alito noted in the Casey uh, partial dissent, 
Determining whether a burden is due or undue is inherently standardless. <clears throat> whether a burden is deemed undue depends heavily on which factors the judge considers and how much weight he accords each of them. The Casey plurality tried to put meaning into the undue burden test by setting out three subsidiary rules, but these rules created their own problems. The first rule is that a provision of law is invalid if, it, if its purpose or effect is to place a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before the fetus attains viability. But whether a particular obstacle qualifies as substantial is often open to reasonable, de reasonable debate. In the sense relative here, substantial means of ample or considerable amount, quantity, or size. Huge burdens are plainly substantial and trivial ones are not. But in between these extremes, there is a wide gray area. So there's so much just subjective, you know, subjectivity that judges have to make when applying th this rule that it's crazy. For example, if you say, oh, you have to, the, the abortions have to be performed at a hospital. Well, I grew up in an area where there was one hospital in the county. So some people had to drive an hour and that's if it wasn't snowing, if it wasn't winter time. So I remember having to go to the hospital on Christmas day. I was out on the other side of a lake and I got hurt sledding. So the roads were icy. Of course. I mean, it, it took an hour, hour and a half to get to the hospital. So imagine if you have to get an abortion at a hospital. Well, that's an undue burden because some people have to drive to a hospital too far away and that's an undue burden. Well, okay, that judge thinks it's undue burden. This judge thinks it's not an undue burden. And basically you have the Supreme Court just going, yeah, I don't think that's an undue burden. Do you think that's an undue burden? I, you know, it's like five to four, it's an undue burden. You know, it's, that's not what lawyers do in this country. That is what legislators do. And our Supreme Court should not be acting as legislators. They should be interpreting the laws and the laws need to be workable. The case law needs to be workable. Roe and Casey are not workable. So there's strike three and we, we still have two more. So now moving on to the next, the next criteria here effects on other areas of the law. Roe and Casey have led to the distortion of many important but unrelated legal doctrines, and that effect provides further support for overruling those decisions. Members of this court have repeatedly lamented that no legal rule or doctrine is safe from ad hoc nullification by this court when an occasion for its application arises in a case involving state regulation of abortion. The court's abortion cases have diluted the strict standard for facial constitutional challenges. <clears throat> they have ignored the court's third-party standing doctrine. They have disregarded standard, I don't know how to say that, principles. They have flouted the ordinary rules on the severability of unconstitutional prov provisions, as well as the rule of statute should, uh, that statute should be read where possible to avoid unconstitutionality. And they have distorted First Amendment doctrines. So you have a made-up right that is not in the Constitution, and it is polluting other rights that either are, well, other rights like the First Amendment. It's definitely polluted that. There are numbers of cases where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, abortion clinics are somehow like, almost like churches, like you can't protests within a certain distance in fact i mean they're you know there as far as i know there's no rules on you being able to protest outside of church at a certain distance so i'm not i'm not aware of any if i'm wrong leave in the comments but yeah it it goes all over the place here and then it also throws off all this all the courts all the way the courts handle things the way you know the way lawyers have to argue these cases it it's basically like i said it's just polluted um, other areas of the law. And I mean, 
there there's basically not another right there's not another constitutional right that isn't on the chopping block if it gets in the way of abortion so yeah that that's another one strike four you are not you know this these two cases are polluting the rest of supreme court work the rest of federal court work and it's you know we shouldn't have that anymore now remember that's strike four and it's still according to justice alito not good enough to overrule roe and casey so you go on to the fifth one reliance interest reliance interests we last consider whether overruling roe and casey will up end substantial reliance interests Traditional reliance interests arise where advanced planning of great precision is most obviously a necessity. In Casey, the controlling opinion conceded that those traditional reliance interests were not implicated because getting an abortion is generally unplanned activity and reproductive planning could could take virtually immediate account of any sudden restoration of state authority to ban abortions. For these reasons, we agree with the Casey plurality that conventional concrete reliant interests are not present here. So even Planned Parenthood versus Casey, even that decision said, yeah, I mean, this, you know, there's not a lot of reliance on, on Roe v. Wade. There's not a lot. People don't rely on the ability to get an abortion. You have, you know, get, get condoms, get, uh, you know, there's birth control. There, there's so many different types of birth control, especially now. You know, people ask like, "What's changed?" It's like, well, we have there's there's newer abortion or not abortion. There's newer birth control, you know, methods of birth control, and then there's the good old fashioned, you know, abstinence. You know, you know, be more careful about who you, who you have sex with. All right, you know, if uh, you know, Beyonce said, put a ring on it. So, you know, do that. So there you go. That's strike five. So. That's why Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey were both overturned today. They are garbage law. They are, gar- they are garbage legal decisions, and they should have never happened. Roe v. Wade should have been overturned in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, not, not replaced with some extra garbage on top of it. 